All right, welcome to another edition of our virtual speaker series. We have Kent Bennett, who is one of the partners at Bessemer Venture Partners, and probably the closest partner to uh, to our off to our um, you know from his office to to our um, classroom, just given that it's only a few blocks away. So thank you so much, I'm Kent. Cool. We had we really enjoyed having you last year in person. Obviously, you can't do that right now, but uh, but we'll we'll give you the floor and be excited to hear more of your insights. So I was there in person last year. I'm gonna have to take your word for it. Man, that feels like a lot. Yeah, I think it was October of 2019. Okay. Uh, so the first academic year, but it feels like it was a decade ago. Cool. Yeah, and I probably shared some of the stuff that I, I'll share here today. Let me, I'm gonna go ahead and show some slides because why not? Yeah, but we have mostly first years in here, so they didn't get to see it. Oh, good. <laughs> Always new. Um, well, awesome. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. I mean, so I'm, um, as you said, I'm a partner at Bassmore Venture Partners, which is a five minute walk from your campus, um, at least when I used to be there. I'm not out in Newton um, in my attic, but um, I could walk there in, I don't know, 35 minutes. Um, and uh, I've been here for 13 years at Bessemer. Um, in those 13 years, I've invested in, you know, pretty much every, um, many sectors, call it, of, um, of both the tech and healthcare landscape, but I would say I've focused more than anything on consumer facing technology, as well as um, some, I mean, increasingly a lot of uh, software, vertical software facing consumer facing verticals, as well as getting increasingly into like more B2B software, logistics software, things like that. But it's all for me, a journey of being led by, you know, what do I think is interesting in any given time? That's the Bessemer system is allowing us to go and, um, you know, focus on whatever we think is is most relevant, most interesting in the world. Um, so I'm going to whip through a bunch of slides, um, and uh, maybe I'll do that as quickly as possible and, and, and have some time for some questions. I mean, we have a way, a way to do questions in this session, I'm assuming. So uh, usually people can put their hand up in Zoom and uh, and I'll call on them as as appropriate. And usually we get through pretty much everyone's questions. Awesome. Great. So um, so without further stuff, there we go. Cool. So Bessemer, man, this is out of date. We're, we just closed on a three and a half billion dollar fund. We have 20 partners. You know, we're growing exponentially. Um, I'll describe some of the patterns of exponential growth we look for in our startups. but. Uh, but we're having one of those moments ourselves, um, like many VCs these days. Um, you know, one of the struggles for us is it's a larger fund. And so when you close on a three and a half billion dollar fund, you find that the entrepreneurs you talk to assume that you can only write like $20 million checks. You can't possibly do seed investing, but that's actually what we do is seed series A, um, you know, early stage investing. With, the fund, with our fund scale, we can do later stage investing. We often will. Um, enter later, but we love being there, you know, in sort of the first or second round. Um, as an investor, write a bunch of seed stage um, checks. I think of the last six investments I've made, four were million dollar, or million to two million dollar checks. So that's a big comfort area for us. These are my girls. I just had a third girl. My, my latest startup is now four months old downstairs um, and live in uh, Newton. Um, so today, the, the couple of topics I like to hit, um, one is just what is the one thing I've sort of figured out in, um, you know, it took me maybe a decade to figure out in venture, um, which is, you know, I think the only thing that really matters is an investor to understand. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about why this thing I'll talk about that may seem sort of obvious, but it isn't really because people miss it all the time and why, why I think that is. You know, what are the mental traps that people um, fall into? And then maybe a little bit of like what startups look like post COVID. This is, I, I, I had a talk like a year ago um, in which I referenced like, oh, it's gonna be a really tricky time to raise money. And it turns out not, it's been a fine time to raise money, but I'll give some thoughts about the current moment. Um, you know, anyone who's paying attention to venture has probably been exposed to this concept um, which is that, you know, while private equity returns might look like this, in other words, you make a set of investments, you might get a couple that sort of are 10x like returns, and then a few that lose money, and then some middling outcomes in between. But in the venture world, 
you get a, a curve that looks much more like this, where you get a very small set of investments have, um, you know, really like kind of miraculous returns. And then most um, don't, you know, some could be decent investments, decent returns, but, but when you compare them to these miracles that you hope to catch a few of, um, they end up being somewhat immaterial to the returns of a fund like ours. And so this, I mean, I guess the world has always known this, and this has always been, you know, for as long as the venture industry, this has been a big driver and the shape has been pretty familiar, but it seems to be getting maybe more attention or more dramatic, um, especially as some companies are holding um, their private status longer. And, um, and as a result, I think we've seen a shift in the last um, several years in the venture industry to really obsessively focusing on what are those um, companies at the top of the tail, which again, I think you could argue should have been the focus all along in some ways, if you're just purely economically motivated. Um, but, um, but now there's a real obsession with a kind of unicorn hunting type dynamic. Um, and, you know, I think what gets lost because it's so freaking noisy out there is that these companies that have these remarkable outcomes are, um, extremely rare. This is from just a, a little analysis we did, um, looking at us based major consumer exits by year. And, you know, we, we noted that it's something like, you know, three and a half, um, unicorn exits a year again, in the consumer world in the US um, for the past decade. And this graph is not all that different. I mean, you, there are some very notable ones and they stick in our head in big ways, DoorDash and Uber, and you know, obviously a lot of these great companies. But it, it, if you just count them all up, they are very, very rare, especially relative to the number of investments that are made. And I think if you look at the enterprise world, um, the number gets bigger, but it doesn't get like exponentially bigger. So you know, as, as venture investors or as entrepreneurs, I think we, we have to face the fact that something's happening in the universe a couple dozen times a year in the United States, um, where a company gets formed that will ultimately have like a hyper efficient growth to like a, to an exceptional outcome. And there's just a bunch of noise that makes it seem like it's much more common than that, but it's, it's really a handful of times. And so I think that's an interesting, um, maybe conditional piece of evidence that um, it's not just like really smart people working really hard that makes it happen, that something else is sort of um, a part of it that it, it may not be as easy to manufacture as, you know, take some talented people and put them in a room and work hard. Um, you know, what I would say is when you see these, call it on their way to being great, future great startups, um, if you know what you're looking for, they're not, in my opinion, impossible to spot. And so I think the job of a VC is in some ways very, very easy, but, um, but may require some patience. That, the hard part may be that, you know, if let's say that we accept as truth that there are a couple dozen companies a year formed in the US and maybe a, a you know, a single digit multiple of that globally. Um, and that our job as venture investors or as entrepreneurs is to found them or to spot them, um, you know, we're just not going to see many of them. You're not going to see these things all that often. And so in some ways, I think the job of a, of a VC is to get patient and to recognize that in your career, you may not see more than one or two of these a year if you're doing a really good job. Um, or, and by see, I mean, have a real opportunity to meet a team and invest, you know, potentially invest, et cetera. Um, because when you see, when you do spot them, especially after their launch, but even I, I could argue before their launch, um, there are some really stark signs typically of why, why these sorts of businesses that eventually have these exponential growth paths um, are quite different. Um, so this is a little bit focused on the consumer world, but um, something I noticed when I spent a lot of time in consumer is that, um, but it, I do think it applies to enterprise as well, is that when you find a great product, you tend to find that they have what I, what I call here a positive resting growth rate. And that simply means that if you do the thought exercise of, let's say I don't spend any more money on sales and marketing so that like between today and period zero, I, I labeled nerdily, um, and tomorrow in period one, I will probably lose some of my existing customers. That's certainly true in the consumer world where you know people die and people move on for a number of reasons. But it, at some level, if you define it, 
depending on how you define it, it's true in the enterprise world. You know, you'll have a set of customers and they won't all be with you forever. You'll have some level of gross churn at least. Um, and so the question, the thought exercise that I think is useful is if you spent no more money on sales and marketing, basically no effort um, externally to generate demand, would you grow? Would you have some level of organic growth? And um, again, I think that the best companies in history almost all have some version of this happening, which is if they had almost no sales team, or maybe they have salespeople just taking orders, but they've done something so special that the phones are ringing and they're growing, even if they're not making a huge effort to do so. Um, now, of course, if they then invest a lot of effort in growing, um, then they get compounding returns on that because they've done something you know, pretty special. Um, so what have they done? special, in my opinion, is that they have found themselves um, with uh, not just product market fit, what I call here, seems a little cheesy and like, what's the difference, but, um, but radical product market fit. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that like, there is an undeniably superior utility to their product versus anything the world has ever seen. It's like easy to describe. It doesn't take typically a PhD to understand like why Uber is better than a taxi. Um, it's faster, it's another version of utility is it's just like, um, it may be, you know, it saves people a lot of time and effort. Um, it's cheaper, so I think this is pretty key. It's pretty rare to find these companies growing really fast when they're asking customers to start spending more money on a new solution versus their um, alternative. And so the combination of better and cheaper is rare, but, but when those two come together, you tend to see um, this sort of exponential growth. Um, and often in the consumer world, it's nice if they have sort of a heart, um, like an emotional association with consumers that can drive um, some extra growth on top, especially if you're relying on your, your existing happy customers to market you. You want them to think not only that they love your product, but that they're proud to be associated with it. Um, I'm gonna skip the example that I had here because they're very consumer specific, but, um, but I think this applies to enterprise too. So in our best enterprise software companies, we find that you have the same dynamic that you have like a product that has a clear, easily describable dominant value proposition versus an alternative. That leads to happy customers who stick around for a long time and they either promote the product directly to their peers who end up buying it or they promote it online um, the word gets out on the, on how great the product is, and, and that's the core of the growth driver. Um, so where does this come from? So, so like, it, it seems like, in some ways, what I'm saying is like, seems I'm sure very obvious, which is like, oh yeah, I should have a product that has like a dominant value proposition versus an alternative and is cheaper, of course. <laughs> Why didn't I think of something that's 10 times better and cheaper? Um, you know, the, the reason obviously is that it's really hard, like, you can't just will these things to happen. And in my opinion, what, what actually is the typical pattern is something first has changed in the universe that enables a smart entrepreneur to come along and say, wait a minute, like there was an earthquake yesterday. There's like a new fault line here. Um, and I'm going to build a house that takes advantage of that new shape of the earth. Um, and that's, that's sort of the thing to look for. So as entrepreneurs, as investors, I think it's interesting to constantly think to yourself, like what are the things that have changed um, about you know, the planet, about the universe, and, and what sort of new product attributes did those changes enable? Um, uh, you know, so maybe there's like some new technology that enables some new functionality. Maybe there's some new method of distributing something. Maybe there's a new way to make something incredibly cheap. Um, maybe there's a new business model that allows you to sell something in a different way economically that makes it more affordable to consume or, or consumable, um, you know, by usage. But importantly, like, it's not just about there's new technology. That's not a why now. It's like, what can you do with a new piece of technology that enables you to deliver on a superior set of product attributes? Um, or sometimes there's a new type of customer, and that could be that we're like, opening up a region of the world that didn't have a product formally, or there's some new um, regulatory pain in the butt that you know, is driving new customer behavior, or maybe there's just some you know, slow evolution in, in um, 
human behavior or occupational things that's creating a new um, you know, a new human need. So these are sort of slower things to evolve um, the uh, the landscape of what could be possible. But there are there are things to look for. Um, so for me these days, whenever I um, and, and yeah, I would cite the eternal customer pain, like oh humans are mortal. That's not like a good why now. Um, and so you know there are these eternal pain points but if they haven't changed recently and you're sort of saying like wow there's this really exciting business that's addressing that pain point you, you i think it's helpful to feel great about the opportunity to tell be able to tell yourself a story of like why it's happening right now and why it didn't happen 20 years ago um so but don't overthink it i mean sometimes it takes a while to figure out why now and exactly why things are happening so the first thing I look for as an investor or as an entrepreneur are just the signs of radical product market fit. And I've talked a little bit about these, but what are they? Um, it's the company grows without marketing. It's that you know customer referrals and organic growth um, are driving a ton of a uh, ton of momentum. That you see like incredible close rates when you know when a customer or a consumer prospect understands what the product does, they're like all in. They're like, yep, this seems like a no-brainer, um, and I want it. Um, you tend to see that those users love the product, can't live without it. Product is a no-brainer. You know, if you ask them, um, if you took it away, how they feel, they're incredibly depressed. Um, you know, this is just not a normal reaction you get to most products that are presented to a market. But when you look at um, the early days of like a Shopify or a, um, a Twilio or some of these like, you know, future multi-multi-billion dollar incredible um, companies, uh, you saw these signs very early of just obsessive customers, um, you know, organic growth. Um, your customers are obviously very loyal, buy more if they can. Uh, I would give bonus points for capital efficiency. So usually when these things line up, it me means the business model gets pretty good pretty quick because you have such, a, uh, such an efficient close rate and you have this organic source of leads typically that you know you spend less on sales and marketing than a relative competitor, and you um, and you see like you know incredible cycles of um, value for the company. It's not always the case because some of these businesses, um, you know, what they're doing sometimes is innovating on a business model in a way that they're like massively disrupting the economics of an old school business. So there might be like thin margins, which means the business might not be you know incredibly efficient, but usually the two go hand in hand. Um, so if we were look to look at certainly like the best consumer investments we've ever seen um, um, and, and most of the great enterprise investments we've seen, um, they tend to be like exceptionally efficient, at least in the early days. And then there's often a question of like how much you want to invest to, to, to kind of push the margin of their growth. Um, and so you can drive them to inefficiency with marginal investment, but, um, but normally left to their own devices, they grow pretty efficiently. Um, I already said all this. So, you know, so that's I, like, I'll, I'll wrap there on the obvious concept, which is like radical product market fit. It's unbelievably rare. Um, it's, it's not hard to, to tell yourself you have it when you have it because you have such a demonstrable, provable utility advantage and economic advantage typically that anybody you describe your product to wants it and, um, and they tend to go on and tell their friends. Um, you know, most of us are unlikely to bump into one of these as a founder in our lives. It's just incredibly hard to find. You gotta be a combination of really talented, right place, right time, um, and you know, some luck on top of that. Um, but when you see them, you know them. And so as a, as a student thinking about joining a company, um, you know, it's often like the gratuitous and, and easy advice, but like these companies are, they're in the world. They're, they're sort of obvious to anyone who's paying attention. Um, and I think in one interesting career move is to join one of these at the right moment, maybe before they're public or before they're exited um, and just benefit from what it feels like to be on that kind of radical growth wave. Um, bonus points for market size. So you can't always pick um, or really understand in the early days the ultimate size of your market, but a lot of the great outcomes, you know, could be a $5 billion outcome or a $100 billion outcome. And the Delta there tends to be more driven by the ultimate size of the market they're playing in than by the, um, you know, any particular business model choice. Um, and then defensibility is a nice thing. 
we hear terms like strong network effects, barriers to entry, IP defensibility. Like for me, the order of operations is first decide, are you at one of those moments of radical product market fit? And then after that, start to think about how big is this market? How much longer can this go? And you know, how many competitors are we going to attract or can we build um, defensibility over time? There's another word for defensibility that we don't use. Um, so I think I've made this point. So radical product market fit. If you see it, please give me a call. That's what it's what I'm looking for. Um, you know, I would say that um, a lot of investors focus on lots of things, and and I, I'm more singularly focused on this product market fit um, concept. I think it's because most of the other things are prone to very kind of biased and superficial reads of like. Um, somebody's taste and often investors are matching some pattern of some you know, previous success they had and it can be really misleading. Um, and so for me, again, like the first thing to figure out is like, is there something really special happening from a product standpoint? And then from there, I can, I can look at some of the other elements. Of course, we're going to want to invest in teams that we like who are ethical or working hard, et cetera. Um, but we don't want to shut down the conversation before we've decided, you know, are they at the nexus of something special? Um, you know, I think smart people miss this a lot and that's, you know, because first of all, if you're founding a business, it's like incredibly scary to stare at a blank piece of paper and say like, what, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and so you can fall into a bunch of pitfalls and I'll blow through a couple here, but the one that, um, I see a lot and it's a little bit, it's got a little bit more MIT signature on it than, um, than other places at times. So just an extra word of caution is people fall in love with technology. So it's like artificial intelligence, Bitcoin, nanotechnology, clean technology, you know, these areas of just like broad technology um, waves that often come with like massive execution challenges. Like these things are hard to do, um, but they tend to be very comforting to people who are like, I want to sound like I'm doing something very special and fancy. So I'm not like, hide behind my technology. So whenever a product um, or a company pitch um, leads with a sort of a buzzword bingo of various, you know, state of the art technologies, I get nervous that there hasn't been any discovery of like a really strong product market fit. And instead they're kind of hiding behind the, um, you know, we're smart, we can build good technology. And, you know, brilliant people have spent like trillions of dollars um, on tech challenges that didn't really have any, you know, um, hope of breakthrough or core product market fit, just sort of hiding behind the tech. So, so be careful about that. Um, the um, trend spotting is another one we see a lot. It's like, what's the, what are the sort of like trendy buzzwords of the day? Um, you know, this of that people say, oh, this is Shopify for X. I, you know, I think that there's like useful exercises to do and saying like, what are the, what are some successful companies? And let me think about some analogs. But that alone is not a company. And that alone is usually a pretty obvious um, idea because a lot of people are doing this. And so, you know, more than that, um, it's usually not that easy. It's usually not as easy as just taking Uber and, you know, translating it to the boat market, which, you know, I think there were like four or five Uber for boats startups that we saw come through that were like well funded and all that stuff. And it didn't really work. Um, it just wasn't the same same need in that market. Um, and so, you know, I think ultimately also you got to recognize like people talk about trends, but the real value is created by a very small number of companies. And so people will say like, oh, Uber for X is the trend. And it turns out it was just kind of Uber, maybe DoorDash, but, um, but there weren't like a hundred companies that were sort of benefiting from that trend. Um, so instead of that kind of top-down trend spotting, I just advise people like think about more bottoms up, um, ways of just getting in touch with um, some more obvious ideas. So um, I often listen for conventional wisdom where people say things like, man, government technology is just a lousy sector and there will never be a good company built there. Um, and maybe that's true, but you know, I don't know, the government is like a potential multi hundred billion dollar, if not trillion dollar um, buyer of IT, like might make for some good businesses someday. So I, I like, I love running away from the crowd of investors. And, and, you know, often you find that there are fewer entrepreneurs when you run away from the investor crowd as well. 
but you can find yourself in some in some really big markets that have real needs and not as much intense you know competition from other startups or or investors. Um, you know, there's just no substitute for talking to customers. That's like where all the all the gold is. Um, you know, find, finding yourself at conferences of dying industries that are massive, like, so they're dying in terms of the sort of talent and the innovation, um, but they may be massive because they may be, you know, they're most huge parts of our economy um, don't have like cutting edge Silicon Valley tech, but, um, but they have needs. Um, and so I think those are interesting places to prospect, especially if you have like an inside track for some of those. And um, you know, use your eyes and ears more than your brain. Like, don't get caught up in the blog posts. Um, recognize there are twenty dollar bills lying on the ground in a lot of these areas that are overlooked. Um, and um, and sometimes you don't have to overthink a solution, especially like in this era. You know, we're in the golden age of recurring revenue software, which I think continues to hit a bunch of sectors that just don't have any great software. And so I think great entrepreneurs can focus on a sector that's been completely underserved by SaaS. And um, and come up with great you know, SaaS business formation ideas. Um, we find some entrepreneurs are themselves. They think of themselves as bad salespeople, so they'll come up with an idea, but they won't really test the demand for the idea because they'll say like, "Well, I'm not the person to be able to sell it." And I think that's a that's a trap um, because you know if you have an idea that's really good, if you're a terrible salesperson, you can still sell it if it's really good as long as you can. You know, describe it in a coherent way. Um, you're going to find customers who like it if it's if it's really that strong of a product market fit idea. Um, another thing smart people do is they try to reinvent the wheel. They'll say things like, "Well, I'm starting this business. It's okay, but like eventually, when we get big enough, we're going to sell the data, and then we're going to sell ads on our platform." They have these like super creative, like um, you know, bank shot ideas on how to turn a business into something good that I think are dangerous. Um, and I'm going to speed through this. Last thing is the VC game. I think like, you know, again, when you're staring at a blank piece of paper and your, you know, grandmom is asking you what you're doing for a living after you spent all this money on an MBA education, it's, um, it's really scary and you don't have any validation. It's really nice to have raised some uh, venture capital because it's like this branding thing that says like you're on the right track. And so, um, a lot of people solve for that. They say, oh, like, I've, got, I've got to, first of all, like my business has to lead to my next funding round. Um, and, you know, they back sell from that. They get into this process on fundraising. Um, they interact with um, VCs who ask you kind of probing questions. May not be all that relevant to the actual business, but they're really clever. And um, if you impress them, they give you some money. Um, they give you a term sheet. They take you out to dinner. It feels very, very good. Um, and often those VCs don't know any better than you if your business is good or not. And so they fund you to increase your burn and then you got to do it all over again. And people get caught in this, this cycle of venture fundraising, which I think can be really, really dangerous. Um, you know, I think if you have the right idea, your fundraising should be like very boring and very easy, which is you should just go out there and like tell VCs what's happening. Like, okay, we talked to 10 customers, eight of them signed up for a pilot. Um, here's what we're doing. Um, you know, many will pass because VCs, you know, are, are human and they'll miss it. Um, but you talk to enough and you have radical product market fit. I, I, I this is like maybe survival, survivor bias, but it's hard for us to think of stories of like really incredible product market fit, great business model businesses that couldn't raise a lot of money. I, I can't tell you the story of the one. Um, and so, um, you know, let the VCs come to you um, make, make your standard that like, if you're going to raise money, you do it with, you know, no effort. And if it takes forever and a day and a ton of effort, then maybe, maybe something's not there yet. Um, and you should rethink, um, the fundraising path. Um, and then remember, like you get stuck with these VCs forever. So, um, you know, you should be the one, um, uh, buying, not the VC. You should be the one sort of deciding, um, who you get to put on your business, especially if you have that level of product market fit, you'll have lots of options. Um, okay. And then I'm going to wrap quickly on, you know, I, I don't think COVID changes much. I think we're, um, going to come out of this world and we're going to have some trends obviously towards remote education and, and remote work. And those are like the hottest, most competitive places to build products at the moment, because everybody's been paying attention to that. 
So my advice for entrepreneurs wouldn't be to oversolve for the COVID moment of, um, of uh, you know, need and traction. Um, you could get some false signal there. And I would just sort of treat the world as if it's going to return mostly to normal and, um, and think of your business that way. Um, you know, start to take a long time. They take 10 years or more. Um, we're about to be through this thing, we hope. And, um, you know, and actually the pandemic has not been bad for software. So many of the categories that you would have started a business in have done just fine um, in the past year. Um, you know, like I said, I'm not too excited about some of the COVID themes because I just think there's false signal. There's a lot of competition. There's a lot of overfunding. Um, this is a little bit out of date. And this is like a year ago, I gave a talk where I said, you know, but fundraising may be hard right now. And that's not been the case. It's been a really frothy, um, you know, nice time to raise money um, in the past year. Um, I think in part because um, people have seen these software models really hold up and many of the consumer facing um, products do okay as well. And, um, and in some ways it's easy to raise money when all you have to do is click on the next Zoom link and you can stack meetings up back to back to back. So just the speed of um, the investor conversations has been really fast and I think favors entrepreneurs, um, which is a good thing. Okay. And my startup career advice is to think about, you know, if you're going to join a company, pick a winner. <laughs> don't, don't take the sort of product market fit risk. Find something that has it where, where you can describe it, where you can sell it to a lot of people. Um, and then, you know, you join and you get the benefit of uh, four and eight priced, you know, low priced options that can be incredibly lucrative if the company continues on an exponential trajectory, not to mention, you know, even if you join late, you get the career halo if you've worked for a great company with a great brand. And that's a great, great way to start a career. Um, you know, working for people who are great, who will teach you things is always a good, good thing. And, you know, think of this, I think, think of the um, startup world as a multi-stage game where um, you can kind of cross the pond in several hops, so to speak. So you don't have to have like incredible title at an incredible startup on day one. You can have a fine title at a great startup and then leverage that to, you know, um, you know, subsequent moves that, um, that are great where you kind of rise in title, you rise in equity, um, you know, but always, again, um, until, until you're really ready to take a ton of risk, joining a company that doesn't have that clear product market fit first, I think is, um, is almost impossible to do unless you're the founder um, in terms of a risk adjusted value prop. Okay. I'm saying don't go into VC. It's a place to retire, not to start. If you hear all this and you're, you're still like a tech junkie and you must pursue it, feel free to email me. I'm happy to give you um, advice on VC. We do some internships over time here um, that have been quite fun. We've had some full time hires um, out of Sloan who have been great. Um, that's what I got. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for walking through that. Uh, very interesting to, to hear a pre-pandemic and, and hopefully closer to post-pandemic version of, of this. Um, so a couple questions I have and then we'll open it up. So the first one is over the last five or so years, the, the best emerging cloud index has been up pretty much a thousand percent. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of new investors that five years ago either didn't exist or weren't playing in your neck of the woods, so to speak. A lot of the hedge funds, um, you know, even, you know, early stage angel or series A firms getting into more growth. Uh, what's the environment like right now for you? And as far as moving quickly, uh, what, what do you think um, potentially you're not doing now that you did before as far as diligence or um, you know, what, what, what's changed as far as, as far as the rapid pace of investing these days? Yeah. I mean, I think most of that action is, um, taking place at, um, past the, our sweet spot of investing is, as more early stage focused entrepreneurs, but it's definitely beginning to creep down into the sort of like series A, series B investing, but but I'd say most of the dollars there, like when you ever, when you look at the graphs, you're like, oh my God, there's so much money flooding into this asset class. But most of it is, is the sort of multi hundred million dollar rounds that are happening at the sort of B and C stage. Uh, and so we don't see a ton of direct competition, but we see some, you know, I think we have remained early stage focused on entrepreneurs. And if anything, we're pushing even earlier. Um, 
I don't think we've changed or relaxed our diligence process, but I think we've always known enough to know this is not about like, um, you know, crazy diligence. And in some ways, um, when we see those later stage, on, like investors push into the early stage, their term sheets can be laughable. They want like quality of earnings audits and, you know, often hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal expenses and things like that, that just are totally inappropriate for early stage. Um, not always. But so um, that's my answer. It's, it is getting harder, but it's really getting harder after it gets obvious. And, you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe, you know, maybe like there's a set of investors who are willing to take this sort of like pre completely financially obvious from a metric standpoint risk. Um, and, um, and that's pretty much where we've always played. Got it. Great. And then my other question for you is, Toast has been one of the most exciting software companies in the Boston area over the last few years. Uh, as many of our students are considering internships or, or post MBA roles, can you speak a little bit to updates on Toast, especially as you know a lot of folks are getting back into restaurants and how the company is 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 uh, is planning for the next couple of years? Yeah, look, I, I think um, more broadly, I would say that SaaS software has done surprisingly well through COVID. Um, and so businesses that, you know, you thought would have been neutral in COVID have done really well. Certainly going into COVID, we expected businesses that served the verticals that would be hardest hit by the pandemic to be really hit. But those like Toast that said, well, gosh, like we serve all these customers, they're in real trouble right now. What do they need to, to do well for this year? And so Toast focused on you know, features for online ordering, for um, allowing guests at restaurants to order and pay at the table without, um, you know, as much interaction with the server for kind of all the stuff that a restaurant needed to survive um, actually shocked us and did, you know, much better than we um, would have expected maybe even pre-pandemic. So, you know, Toast is is um, live and well. And, and uh, if anyone's considering working there, I think it's, you know, one of the um, most compelling companies I've ever seen in my life. And I, they're serving, you know, it's this vertical software company, which is this awesome general trend to take these horizontal software platforms and like really address the needs, the really specific needs of a, a given vertical. Um, so that in, in itself, like I just be on the lookout for that as, as, as the types of companies to join, like what are the platforms that will really transform these, these vertical industries? But just so happens that Toast is doing it for like, you know, one of the largest, if not the largest, depending on how you define it, verticals around. And so there are, you know, 800,000 plus restaurants in the United States. That's a lot of potential customers, like huge market. Um, so, you know, we're hopeful for more good things to come there. Um, awesome. Great. Yeah. seems like a really great time for, for people to, to consider working there. So, okay. So let's go to the next question. So feel free to raise your hands. If you do have questions you want to type, I'll, I'll call on you to, to read them out, but I'll start out with Rob. Thank you, Justin. Hey, Ken. Um, so my, my question is more about when you look at early stage companies, what, what, what are you looking for? Um, you know, how, how much is, where, where does traction uh, rank in, in terms of that, that, that list and what is traction in your mind? Yeah, I, I really, um, I, I think a lot of VCs do look for traction. They have some definition of traction. They'll say things like, oh gosh, if you're not at a million of ARR, like we can't really think about it. For me, what's compelling are signs of traction that are not quantitative, right? So it's like the hidden traction, which is, you know, for a pre-launch product, can I take the idea, the, the concept of the product, and can I myself go out and get five people to say like, oh, when's that available? I, I can't wait for it, right? And so to me, the earlier that you're willing to sort of give a company credit for strong product market fit before the numbers make it so obvious that anybody in the world can figure it out, that's where you can get the really compelling investment opportunities. Um, if, if I see something that's like, oh, we have a super talented person and they're really interested in the fashion industry, but they don't know what they're going to do yet. That's where I have a lot of trouble. Um, and I think there are some investors who, who do a good job of just being like, nope, like Rob is, this, is that special of a person that he will be one of the next 
you know, two dozen people this year to find one of these future radical ideas. I myself like don't trust my own instincts and maybe I don't you know if I believe that other people can really do it consistently to pick a person before they have an idea. Um, but yeah, so for me, once there's an idea, it's like, as soon as I can test that idea in some way, either through what, you know, maybe the anecdotes the entrepreneurs were laying on like the early feedback they're getting from prospect customers, but if I can go out and test it myself even better, um, then I can tell myself like, yep, this is something that's going to be able to sell easily. Um, and that's when I get really excited. Um, and then the more of that you got, the better. I mean, I'm not going to say like, I don't, I don't like more data and I do, but I think it's just a spectrum of like, once it gets to a million of error or 5 million of error are like, it's no longer a secret. And then the question is like, why, why do you have a differential ability to spot that or to win, you know, the, the potential to be the partner there? So, so, so essentially the technology doesn't matter in, in, in your mind, uh, I don't, um, I don't really, I mean, I want to believe it's real and it's viable. And so if somebody's saying that they've got like anti-gravity boots, I'm gonna have some questions, right? But, um, but I, rarely do I get into the, say like I, I know many investors who might like, when they hear about a solution, they're really curious about the architecture of the product of the software. I could care less, right? I, I sort of like, if I think someone is first to market with a radical product market fit idea, I almost, once I've become convinced of that, then I'm really sensitive to talking myself out of an investment for reasons that are, that are fixable, right? Because you could always re-architect the product. You could always hire new executives if you felt like, a, you know, so sometimes I help people say like, oh, the, you know, the CFO seemed really weak. I'm like, who cares? We can hire another CFO, <laughs> like, um, you know, um, if that is true. And by the way, often like people will present in a VC fundraising contest context, they'll present in a sloppy way. And sometimes that's because they're like so annoyed they want to get back to doing work. It's not because they're not great. It's just because they're not great bullshitters. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I think there's just a ton of things that VCs can tra talk themselves out of future fantastic investments because they almost can't believe. Uh, it, it's almost too good to be true sometimes. And so they're like looking for reasons that it's not real. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so Manit. Is uh, she or he there? To read my question. Okay, maybe, maybe can't speak right now. Okay, so the question is, how much does intuition play Oh, she. Okay. <laughs> how much does she? Uh, how much does uh, intuition play into being a successful VC? What has helped you develop this intuition? Um. Yeah. So intuition. I don't, I'm not even sure I would know how to define that for myself, but I do think there is this thing, which is that when you're early in your investing career, you tend to want to make investments, and so you are in some ways forcing it a lot you see things and you're like, okay, could this get really big and good and all that stuff? And then over time, if you if you spend enough years or some people start with this intuition, I didn't, but, um, but over time, if you see enough cycles, then you will have seen a few, you know, or a dozen future unbelievably great companies when they were early. And again, what I think you begin to realize is that they do look different and, but they just don't come along all that often. And so you get much more sensitive to that pattern of what it looks like to have that, you know, really special kind of product combo. And, um, and then you get good at reacting to it. So I probably spend, what that means is over my career, I could probably spend many fewer cycles with businesses that I'm not incredibly interested in. But when I see something really interesting, I'm like reacting very quickly. Great. Uh, okay, so we have another question. What tips would you have for students interested in VC that, oh. Go for it. <laughs> the, uh, some of the arts and crafts are stored in my office. So we get some daily visits. That's a nice dress, by the way. Okay. 
<laughs> Go ahead, Nat. Hi there. Uh, okay. So the next question is uh, for students that don't have traditional finance background, what do you recommend they do during their MBA experience to to um, to become better at, at potentially becoming investors down the road? Yeah. I mean, look, if they want to be a venture capital investor, I really don't think finance is a big part of it. I mean, it's you know, it's good to be like um, literate um, with what a cash flow statement and what a what a you know you know looks like or whatever, but that's not really the thing. Um, and so I would say get some basic. I kind of I'm not going to bore you with like the basics of how to think about the financial model of a startup, but it, but, it, but it's not complicated, right? It's kind of like is the business spending? They're spending some amount of variable sales marketing effort. They've got a variable profit run rate. Is that growing faster than the money they're spending on sales marketing? But, but like, that's the check I'm always doing. And if that ratio is super positive, which it rarely is, but if it is, get really interested and then start to think about how big this could get. How big is this market? You know, what, how could this go wrong? Are there obvious competitors, all that kind of stuff. But, but those latter questions are much less about finance and much more about understanding products, understanding, um, you know, customer needs and, and those sorts of things. So I, you know, I think in the venture world, it does help to understand the tech landscape, how that's been changing, what is new technology, what's old technology and kind of how that evolves is a big deal. And so being a check, if you really want to be a VC, which again, I think is, is, um, I got some questions for you if that's the case, because it's like, you know, you're you, me and a thousand other people are trying to find these dozen companies a year. It's it's a pain in the butt. Um, they're hard to find. But um, but uh, but if you want to be that, I think having a tech obsession, being a tech junkie, a product junkie, I think that stuff is all really useful in the, in the tech investing world, of course. Awesome. And uh, I know you have a, a video series out with, uh, you know, how to calculate LTV and, and some of these metrics. So maybe that's another, you know, source for people to take a look at. Um, okay, cool. So any final questions? I know we have, we have two or three minutes left. Maybe not, but uh, okay, if that's the case, then maybe uh, it'd be great to hear one of your more recent investments and maybe walk us through how you, you know, first came across them. Did they reach out to you? Did, did, did you find them in some way? Um, what was the process like and, and what, what got you excited about the business? Yeah, I'm trying to think of what's public. I mean, one thing I would say as an investor is I encourage people not to publicize their investments or for entrepreneurs not to publicize their fundraising. I think it's like, it's hard for me to justify why, why you would do that early on if you're trying to build like a competitive advantage versus a bunch of other noise out there. I think it's like telling the world like, hey, we just raised a bunch of money from a VC is a great way to get other VCs and other competitors to start to think about like what you're doing right and try to copy you. So don't do that. But um, how about brain base? What's that? How about uh, brain let, base? Let me let me pick on another one, which is Truebill, which was with okay. more recently. Um, so so Truebill is um, is an app for um, personal financial management. So it's like Mint.com, right? And so on the surface your reaction might be what mine was when I first heard about it, which is like, aren't there like a million of those? Like what it feels like a super noisy, you know, crowded space, like what, what gives? And then I tried the product and I had this experience, which is I logged on to it. I gave it my bank and for, yeah, I went to that, done the first couple steps that I've gone, you know, down many times with other personal financial management apps. And it instantly surfaced all these subscriptions. It had this real focus on subscription. I was like, hey man, like you're paying for the Wall Street Journal twice. Like, what are you doing? You're a bozo. And and by the way, did you know you're still paying for Hulu? And there was some other stuff in there. Like I was subscribed to like Orange Theory, which I had not been to in six months, um, which I'm so embarrassed to say. It's like 60 bucks a month. And um, when my wife found out, she was like, I'm going to kill you. Um, but so I instantly saved like $500 a year in just to totally wasted stuff because I, I like many of us, have kind, kind of gotten succumbed, you know, maybe thanks to many of these startups to all these recurring revenue subscriptions. And it's like, a, it's a new and specific financial problem when it comes to managing your finances. And so Truebill has built like this incredible app that's really good at surfacing that and delighting consumers on that front. 
And that has driven a ton of growth for them in a very capital efficient way. And so again, it, it comes down, so that, that investment, I like it because I do believe there's a degree of radical product market fit there. It's not, I'm not gonna lie, it's not Uber, right? Because it's not totally sexy to talk about personal financial management, it's kind of boring, but no matter how cool you make it, but the way they do it is delightful. And people do refer it in an aggressive way. And the customer value prop that they can advertise against is like, hey, log this and we're gonna like take care of all your subscriptions. And I think that has like instant resonance with consumers. And so that's driven a ton of growth for them. But because they're in this space that's kind of noisy where there's been a bunch of traditional noise, it wasn't like a heat map for a bunch of like, you know, VC backed um, competitive garbage. And so it had this nice combination of kind of being able to, you know, isolate it in the space that was all their own, but this like really degree of like very strong product market fit that was driving, you know, real efficiency of growth. And I highly, highly recommend the product. I really can't say enough about just as a consumer product, this is, you know, they've got many hundreds of thousands of subscribers. So this is not me just <laughs> out there trying to pin, you know, a pitch a company because it's a pretty affordable subscription, but um, you should all get it. It's great. Awesome. It looks like we already have some users uh, in the room. Sure, uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, well, great. Well, thank you so much, Kent. Uh, appreciate you coming on virtually and uh, great to meet you know a little bit more of your family today as well. Um, hopefully next time uh, for the for next year, I, I probably will not be there unless I don't graduate, but uh, but hopefully we'll have you in person uh, back at Sloan. Uh, it was great last time and just as great now. So appreciate it again and looking forward to seeing you soon. Awesome. Thanks everyone. I'm, I'm just Kent at BVP.com if anyone wants to email. I'm happy to be helpful any way I can. Yeah, we have a lot of entrepreneurs in here too. So it could be for a lot of reasons you, you might get uh, you might get some emails. Awesome. Thanks so Bye much. Everyone. Appreciate it. Have a good one.